intelligencesquared.com. Right, we've got a copy of your book here. I want you to sign that, and then the best question gets this copy of the book. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> um, you can pick the best question. And um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, you do say who you are. We've got someone at the back over there. If we take, we start with that one over there, and then we'll take a gentleman down here. Yeah. Good evening, Professor Stiglitz. I'm Moritz. Um, because I'm Italian, I would like to ask you, what's your opinion about, for example, Italian policy, economic policy, after this day, increasing fear of default of other countries like Greece, Spain, Portugal, and okay. Ireland, the so-called peaks? So, the sovereign debt issue, which I can, I can preview everybody. Joseph Stiglitz will be talking about on Newsnight tonight, so you can, <laughs> um, you can get the director's cut of this answer uh, on the programme. Yeah, OK, we, what we've done is we, we've converted a private borrowing problem into a public borrowing problem. Exactly. We haven't exactly. solved the problem. It's still a borrowing problem, but we've, we've, we've converted the form of it, haven't we? Um, how worried are you that these, uh, these big state deficits, of which Greece, fortunately quite a small country, is a very extreme example. How worried are you that these are going to explode into serious issues? Uh, not at all. Uh, I think that all these countries have the resources, the capability, and the determination to pay their debts. You know, the, the, the irrationality of the market is highlighted by the fact that the credit default swaps for the United States, the bets that the United States is not, are not going to pay off its debt, have also increased. Now, you scratch your head for a second, and you, anybody who understands American debt knows the following. The American debt is a promise to pay US dollar bills at the end of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, one year, six months. But the fact is, we print those dollar bills. So we will pay that off. <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 there is, you know, there's a zero probability that that will happen. Now, you can bet on whether there's going to be inflation or there's going to be exchange rate, lots of other things. To bet on the U.S. defaulting on the debt so that is weird. That is, is, weird. is weird. And that it's highlights not, to me the weirdness yeah, of the financial but it's markets. Not, unfortunately, <laughs> Greece has no printing press no, no, in its it's side. Greece does not. It cannot no. print euros because I, that's I, in the hands of somebody else. No, but I, I highlight, I, I mention <laughs> that to highlight the irrationality of the markets. Uh, I, and I do not think that there is any real uh, uh, Yeah, but look, of, irrational of, of, markets can go crazy. Like, you know, a exactly, herd of animals, exactly. they can run out. And I can tell you, if you're the Greek finance minister and you've got loans rolling over that you need to roll over, and no one will lend you money. That's a problem. That is a very, very big money. And, and so what is the answer? The answer is that Europe needs to show a certain solidarity uh, and say, we recognize that there is no fundamental right. problem here, that this is a, a craziness of the market. Markets demonstrated their rationality and the lending that they did, their irrational exuberance during the bubble, and corresponding flip side of irrational exuberance, there's irrational pessimism. We'll stand by all of the countries okay. of Europe. And once they do that, uh, th that risk premium should disappear. Uh, if it doesn't, they should go even further and say- I mean, the, we, the Germans we, just may not want to, just, to, to, you're very kind of you to sign up all these obligations of European taxpayers, <laughs> but the Germans may say, look, we told them darn Greeks to sort it out before the crisis. Uh, they didn't do it. Why should we be the ones who pick up the bill any more than your taxpayers well, to pick up I, AIG? I, I think that all of your benefits from the EU, uh, and uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you're now focusing on, on Greece, but look at Spain. Spain yes, had Spain. a budget surplus before the crisis. Spain had better rate banking regulation than the United States. Uh, you can't criticize no, no, you Spain, can't criticize Spain, and yet it's being attacked as well. Mm. Uh, the market uh, is looking at small countries that are having problems, but the problems are, for the most part, not completely, but for the most part, problems originating from the global economic crisis. Ger if Germany were growing strongly, German tourists would be going to Greece, and Greece's income would be higher. Uh, and they would, uh, say, same thing in the case of Spain. If there had not been this uh, rush of money into Spain, they would not have had the housing bubble. The bubble broke, uh, and they are now living the consequences. So it's the consequence of the European framework, and a critical mistake was made at the time the euro was created. In the United States, we have a common currency. Yeah. But we have 
institutional frameworks. We have a large budget to help if California has a problem, money winds it up in California, and we have easy migration. Um, now, migra Europe is a series of countries, and it and could easily be that resources, it's a much more of a hassle to get resources to Greece exactly. at the end. Let's take some more questions. We've got a gentleman in blue over there, and then I'll take the gentleman in white over here, just, and then we'll take the gentleman in the front row over there. Yeah, we'll take a few at a time. Yeah. Uh, Professor Stiglitz, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm David Hillman from Stamp Out Poverty. Um, as I think you know, tomorrow the Robin Hood tax campaign will be launched in the UK. Uh, a campaign that uh, calls on the government to tax financial institutions on their trillions of dollars of transactions, which could potentially raise billions of pounds to save jobs here, to, to increase development spending and, uh, and spending on climate change. But my question to you is, what are your thoughts on the feasibility of financial transaction taxes? So that's the Tobin tax, effectively, the uh, Tobin tax. Broader than Tobin tax, okay. Big taxes on financial. Yes, and then we had a gentleman over here in the white over there. That's it. Pass over to him. Um, it's an election year uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, and uh, it seems like parties on both sides, on all sides of the aisle, are falling over themselves to talk about how much they're going to cut. Even Obama is is. Uh, uh, promising that he's not going to um, that he's going to freeze the the budget except for uh, sacred defense spending. Uh, is this a prescription that you think makes sense? Okay, and then we had a gentleman down here in the front row. Let's take this one. Yep. Uh, hi, I'm a graduate student at uh, UCL, and I'd like to ask. You spoke about the issue of cognitive capture in central banks. Now. I'm not certain how make, putting central banks under control of the government again would necessarily protect them from cognitive capture, and surely it just adds the possibility of rent seeking to that as well. Very good question. Um, well, we'll take all of those, but I just wanted to start you off on that last one, because the criticism of your big intellectual approach is that markets are rubbish, really, aren't they? I mean, they, you, you've demonstrated that ample, amply, <laughs> and then you just have to say, but how good are the governments? You know, these silly central bankers with cognitive capture. Of course, what are the politicians going to have? They're not going to have cognitive capture if they're controlling these things. So just take that one, and then we'll take the other one of cuts. OK. And, and, and the, For, you know, that, the criticism, some of my work that I don't understand, you know, I, I, I'm very good at identifying uh, uh, market failure, but I'm a little bit less astute in, in talking about government failure. Uh, let me say that. Anybody uh, in America who's lived through the Bush administration understands government <laughs> failure. Uh, so so I, I, I really, you know, and feels it very, very strongly. Uh, so I, I do think uh, one has to recognize that. On the other hand, um, what uh, I do think is that if you believe in democracy, it is important to have systems of democratic accountability. And that, uh, talk about the Federal Reserve, for instance, the Federal Reserve is not only independent, but the head of the New York Federal Reserve is appointed by the banks, effectively. And he is the bank regulator and the person who was key in providing money. Now, that's really uh, undermining democratic uh, safeguards. So uh, I, I think that there needs to be some systems of, of, of checks and balances. Uh, but in the end, one of the... Uh, uh, you know, what we have uh, in democratic elections, the most important factor determining the outcome of elections in most countries is the economy. And yet one of the main instruments for controlling the performance of the economy, which is monetary policy, is not in their hands in an independent central bank. And this notion that we can't trust democratic processes in controlling monetary policy, I find very deeply troubling. Um, yes, there are flaws, but so are there flaws in taxation and, and flaws in the bailouts. I've described a lot of the flaws in the political process, but unfortunately, uh, the alternative, I think, is even worse. The, um, yeah, we had a, one about the, cuts in election year and to, the, the sort of yeah. transaction taxes. Let me, let me, on, on, on the uh, deficit reduction, I, I think it's premature to cut back uh, on spending. Uh, 
that, in fact, deficit reduction now will lead to larger debts in the long run because deficit reduction will lead to a, a weaker economy, tax reductions will go down, tax revenues will go down, and particularly if the, uh, if the, if the re reduced spending is spending on investments in education, technology, infrastructure, and those things, you don't get the future tax revenue that you would have gotten from the growth that generated uh, by, uh, by these uh, investments. I do think the implication of the large uh, deficits is that we have to think much more carefully about how we spend money. So I'm very critical of the hundreds of billions of dollars that we spend in the United States on weapons that don't work against enemies that don't exist. Um, we get neither security nor economic growth. So that seems to me a, a, a good target for cutting and reallocating re that money to investments that will lead to higher growth and therefore lower uh, national debt in the long run. Um, the uh, final uh, question uh, on uh, the broad issue of taxing the financial sector, I'm a very strong supporter of that um, uh, for the following reason. We, for reasons, um, we have an overblown financial sector. Uh, one of the reasons that we have an overblown financial sector is that it's been repeatedly bailed out. This is not the first bailout. In the United States, we had a bailout of the SNLs in 1989. But there are a whole host of bailouts with names, Mexico, Thailand, Indonesia, Korea, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Russia, I can go on. But the basic point is these are not bailouts of countries. These are bailouts of mostly the banks that were lending money to these firms in these countries. When the firms couldn't repay, the debts were turned over to the government. The government then borrowed money from the IMF and then they had to repay it, but the money went to the American and Western banks. So these were bank bailouts. So it's not should... charity by the American government to help no. the people of Mexico. It's about bailing it, it, out the bank. It, so you would really think that they should pay their way with sort of, in the good years, paying a tax that would sort of, if you like, build up the pot, which can be spent in the bad years. Yeah. That, but it, isn't Obama doing that? He's got a sort of insurance levy. And, uh, uh, but it's too small. Right. And, uh, but he's also pointed out uh, another thing, which I think is very good. He recognizes that the risk to the taxpayer is larger when you have banks that are too big to fail, uh, too big to be managed, uh, and that the risk is larger when there's higher leverage. So he's trying to shape a tax right. that is targeted, not as finely as I would like, but targeted towards the bigger banks and targeted to the more highly leveraged institutions. They ought to pick up also those that are, leverage ought to include credit default swaps and, and all those other risk-taking uh, activities. Let's take some more questions. We've got a gentleman here first, and then we'll take the gentleman over there, and then... Um, We'll go into that little po portion over there. Yes, sir. Um, good evening. My name's Adrian Carey. Um, I mean, one of the issues must be that the big global banks just really are far too big to fail. Um, one of my concerns is the governments around the world don't seem to be doing anything about it. Um, is that more a function of the lobbying power of the banks? Uh, can they be broken up into clearing banks and the gambling casinos that the investment banks are. Okay, so because we've got to do something. The reform to debate about, uh, about what we do. Let's take the gentleman there. Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Matthias Dackel. I'm currently a graduate student at ECP Europe. And first, I want to thank you for being here. Very interesting views. One topic we haven't covered yet is China. Um, in a kind of improvised um, video interview during the World Economic Forum in Davos, you said something about China that it's uh, pretty well set up to face the crisis. But given the fact that um, the economy could just grow due to uh, very huge uh, government stimulus. What do you think, like, um, yeah, how will China develop in the future and what will be the impacts for the world economy, especially in terms of an asset bubble in China and um, okay. effects on commodity prices? A very small question. Uh, <laughs> and let's take, a, let's take a, there's a little cluster of people around there. Let's just take a few, uh, few from there and then... Um, my name's Figures. Juliet Jarrett. I'm an environment journalist, um, which is related to this question. Um, Given that uh, you have some fundamental criticisms about the dominant economic system, what are your views on extending it, as is um, widely proposed now, to environmental issues, particularly climate change and biodiversity? 
were you on the international panel for climate change? Were you yeah. on the IPC? You, yeah. you were on it. Yeah. So is, is it ha what about extending the market system, I imagine, through cap and trade and uh, such yeah. like, to the, um, the world of okay. environmental bads? Yes. Yeah, so let's take another one from that cluster. There were several. OK, one last one. I'm my, Michael Wellin. I'm a psychologist. I can explain my bias. Um, what I'm intrigued by is what can we do about it in, for real? Um, if we look at history, the thing that stands out to me is Germany, Argentina a few years ago. Um, inflation is the simple solution. It's a horrible one, but we just have 500% inflation, and the bank debts go down to 20%. It's, it's almost like that's the elephant in the room, and we keep pretending it isn't there, but actually, that's really what the governments are trying to achieve, isn't it? Uh, yes, up to a point. And um, <laughs> let's just take one more, because we can then just rattle through. And I'm going to force you to be very quick on the answers. Yeah. Uh, there's an, is there not another one in there? Yes, there's one just there next to you. There we go. That's it. Uh, do we need a shift in the underlying philosophical atmosphere in the United States and here back towards, say, the, the pragmatism of John Dewey rather than the... Uh, sort of mad libertarianism of Noisick and Ayn Rand? Because you, you suggested in a way that economics is a sort of subset of philosophy and economic ideas gather ground according to the sort of philosophical milieu that prevails. And it's hard to imagine how you would get back to... Pragmatism seems a little bit dull in a way now. It perhaps does perhaps less dull now. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe just take... Uh, you know. Be, Keep it fairly tight, because there are other people. Just, just, just comment okay. on some of very, those. Very, very quickly, uh, I do agree that the, there is a serious problem with too big to fail banks. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the things I very welcomed was the initiative of Obama of what called the Volcker Rule to, to do something about the too big to fail banks. Uh, but uh, there are other problems in addition to that, uh, too intertwined to fail, too correlated to fail. Uh, not just the depository institutions, but also the non-depository institutions, uh, I think it's absolutely essential. And uh, I agree with uh, Mervyn King, if you're too big to fail, you're too big to be. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, most of the political leaders, for obvious reasons, have not been willing to uh, do anything about it's, it. It's interesting that the, the economics profession outside the financial institutions, by and large, takes that view. Almost unanimously. It's, it's, it, it, it's it, quite it, a big mismatch when you talk to the city economists and the non- Yeah, I mean, because it, it, it's such an elementary issue of incentives. If you're too big to fail, then you have incentive to gamble, because if you gamble and win, you walk off with the profits. If you gamble and lose, the government picks up the tab. Uh, why not gamble? And so, it's, it's, you know, it won't be the solution. No. I mean, we say it's not the only problem, but it's such a, it's a problem that stares you in the face that why not do something about this? And no evidence that these big ba banks bring any benefit that's anywhere commensurate with the risks that they bring. And that's yeah. why there's yeah. uh, a consensus on that. Uh, the, uh, on the China question, um, China was, you might say, the best student of Keynesian economics. And it really feels good to realize that there's at least one country in the world who studied our textbooks. Uh, they had a very big stimulus, and it worked. Uh, not only that, uh, they understood the principle I was talking about before. Much of their money went for investments, green investments, to create a public transportation system, uh, a high-speed railroad that would change God, the economic geography. Such Rose-tinted glasses of China. They've built bridges to nowhere and motorways all places that have no cars on them. <laughs> Just like Japan, didn't they? Uh, no. No, that was in the earlier, uh, 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 97, 98. They have a lot of uh, roads that, that are, you might say, low-density optimism <laughs> uh, on, on future growth. Um, but uh, the other side of it is, uh, Five years ago in their, in their fifth year plan that they announced, they said, we need to wean ourselves off of this export dependence. Um, they have not succeeded in doing that. And part of their stimulus package, actually, uh, there's a worry that it may have exacerbated that problem because it reinforced some of the capacity in, in steel industry and some of the other industries. And that's the sense where there's a worry going forward that with the ability of the rest of the world to absorb their exports, uh, 
is that model going to be able to continue? And clearly, it has to be changed. And the question is, will it change fast enough? Uh, that raised an issue I didn't talk about, nobody asked about, but let me an answer it anyway. Uh, and that is uh, the problem of global imbalances. And a question the G20 has talked about, and they said, uh, uh, you know, we're going to respond to global imbalances. The US is going to save more, and China needs to consume more. I've been a little critical of that view because uh, going back to the question about climate change, uh, the world can't survive if everybody consumes in the style that the United States has, has been living. And what is needed is not more savings right now, but more investment. Uh, there is investment needed for climate change, investment needed for dealing with the problems of poverty all over the world, uh, billions of people in poverty. So the challenge of the world is, again, one of the financial markets. How do you take the savings and channel it to where it's needed. The problem is, uh, again, I, I talked about the irony of our, 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 our current economic system. Uh, we have a, system, a situation today where we have excess supply, uh, firms that want to produce, workers who want to work, and we have needs, poverty, climate change, that were not being met. And somehow we haven't been able to bring those together. And I, I think that's a, a, a real challenge for the global economic system. Uh, on the um, question about cap and trade, um, I think the crisis highlights the risk of relying on a cap and trade system uh, that is, uh, 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 does not have floors and ceilings. And that's why a lot of the discussion, at least in the United States, is going towards if we get a cap and trade system, it will be with floors and ceilings. But once you have very strict floors and ceilings, you're almost equivalent to, with an auction cap and trade, to a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. And so. You would uh, prefer a carbon I tax. I prefer a carbon <laughs> tax. And I talked in my mm -hmm. previous book, Making Globalization Work, I talk about that as being uh, better. The key thing that firms need is assurance about what the price of carbon is going to be 10, 20, 30 years from now. And you don't get that out of a carbon, uh, uh, out, out of, a, uh, of a cap and trade system. And uh, the prices have been very volatile. And with those volatile prices, it's very difficult for firms to know what kind of technology yeah. to choose going forward. OK, and then we had a final one, I think, about inflation, didn't we? Yeah. And um, uh, the problem. Uh, is, as you say, one of excess leverage. And there are uh, uh, basically three ways of dealing with this. Um, one way is inflation. Uh, which just writes off a lot of the debt. Basically. Which writes yeah. off a lot of the debt. Uh, unfortunately, uh, central bankers in their genes are not going to allow it. Uh, but uh, there's another uh, reason. Most of the debt now is short-term debt, relatively short-term. And that means if markets see inflation, they'll raise interest rates in anticipation of that inflation. And the result of that is that the debts get larger. Um, and what we really risk right now is this worst of all possible worlds where borrowers are going to be charged in the belief that there's going to be inflation but we won't have inflation. So we'll get, pay the price of inflationary expectations with, with, without, without the inflation. Um, so that system, that's not going to work, I think. Uh, the second way that we could do it, and we should have done it, is a restructuring of debt. That's what uh, bankruptcy does. Uh, that's what my, what the thing I've advocated, the homeowners chapter 11. Uh, these are debt restructuring. Many countries have gone through debt restructurings. But there is enormous resistance of the banks to doing that kind of debt So this would literally be going in and saying, look, we're taking this portion of mortgages or this category of mortgages. These are being written down to an affordable, usually an affordable proportion of uh, affordable level. And now you carry on making payments with a realistic mortgage. That's right. right. And that, that You've was, just written off the debt rather than inflated it away. Okay. Well, it, it's going to be written off. It's going to, it's, they can't pay it. So they can't pay it. One way or another, and, and, it has and, to be written and off. And it's just saying, yeah. are we going to struggle on for another 10 yeah, yeah, years? Yeah. Are, are we going to do it smoothly or are we going to muck around? Now, what's the third one then? Muddling through. Okay, which is what we're going to do. <laughs> and, and that's the one we're going yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah, right. Okay, we've got, time for a, oh, we've got time for a couple more questions. And we'll take one here. Yep. 
And then we'll take, um, I'd like to take someone at the back if I can, because I've been a bit undiscriminating against the back. We'll take the lady right over on the, the side over there. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, hi, my name's Susan and I'm a sixth form student. And I'm from what you have discussed tonight. How many of the lessons or recommendations apply to rapidly growing economies like China or India? And are there any additional dangers following macroeconomic management in those countries during the next decade? Okay, so uh, lessons for the high growth economies. Uh, and then we had someone over here. Yep, if you just chuck the mic over as fast as possible. Yep, this is the last batch of questions, I think. Yep. Hi, um, a question from a damn Greek, as it were. Um, my name is Martina Stevis. I am London correspondent for Greek newspaper Eleftherotopia. Okay. First, your happy birthday. <laughs> um, I think it's your birthday today. Um, uh, my question is, you've been invoking this idea of EU solidarity towards Greece, and I assume you'll be bringing this back in the conversation when we start talking more about Spain and Portugal. And I would like you to explain to us whether you would propose that we move towards a further fiscal federalism system in the EU, because you have been comparing it to the, e the US system, and California and Texas have been coming up in the conversation. And also, on the euro, uh, would you diagnose speculation on the part of the markets against the currency? Yeah, the Greek Thank Prime you. Minister said he thought they were being targeted, really. Yeah. And then we'll take one more, and you've got 30 seconds each of these, Professor Stiglitz. Yeah, just pass it right down there, and then we'll have to close. Henrietta Royal, I'm the CEO of City University. Um, Professor, you've been quite tough on the banks, understandably, and the regulators. To what extent do governments themselves, particularly in the UK and the US, also bear a substantial responsibility, uh, particularly in relation to what appear to be quite a strong push to lend to, what, to people who are arguably too poor to borrow to buy houses? Yes, that's a similar one, isn't it, to um, you know, the cognitive capture yeah. question about the politicians yeah. Make mistakes too, but yeah, go ahead. Take take that. Well, let me begin with that one first. Uh, uh, that's an argument that has uh, 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 been pushed forward uh, in the United States, particularly in context of the two uh, what we call GSEs, government sponsored enterprises, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, the uh, uh, point to remember is that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were private institutions. They were privatized. Uh, uh, almost uh, uh, 40 years ago, uh, more than 40 years ago, in 1968. So they are, they always were, they, they, uh, throughout this period, they were private. Now, I wish it were the case that government saying to the banks, we well, think it would be nice for you to lend to poor people, uh, would lead them to behave in the way that we want. Um, right now, we would give a speech and say, we wish we would lend to small and medium sized enterprise, create jobs. And then, oh, lo and behold, we would start having a burst of lending and our economies recover. Uh, the fact of the matter is that banks have never listened to speeches. Uh, uh, they are responding to incentives or distorted. You know, they had incentives for excessive risk taking, incentives for short sighted behavior. Uh, the, uh, there is no evidence in the United States that the mess that the banks got themselves into had anything to do with any speech given by anybody about lending more. Uh, in fact, in the United States, we have some evidence that there was a part of the lending that went to what we call CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, which is money channeled into inner cities. And the default rate on that is lower than on other parts of the lending. So the lending that had a, an, a, a you might say, a, a social objective that was a little bit forced on them actually did better than the, than the other lending. Uh, the, uh, uh, beyond that, uh, we mentioned the single biggest bailout problem was AIG, and that was banks gambling with each other. Yeah. Nothing to do with housing. Uh, I, I wonder, we, we do have to wrap up soon, so I want you to just comment on these other two questions. Oh, okay. I mean, we, we, um, 
Okay. The sixth former here who asked about the, the high growth economy. Yeah, I think one of, one of the lessons for the high growth economies is that they're rethinking some of the, the lectures that they were given <laughs> by the United States. Paulson would go in uh, and other uh, American secretaries of treasure and give lectures to China, India, and say, you ought to follow the American example. Look at our fine financial system and our financial regulation. Uh, that doesn't have the resonance today uh, <laughs> that it did uh, a, a while ago. And the interesting thing is that India, for instance, had, again, better financial regulation than the United States, um, and very thoughtful financial regulation. Uh, Malaysia, uh, you know, when, when American derivative co companies wanted to come, came into uh, Malaysia and they said, we want to sell these derivatives, uh, the Central Bank of, of Malay, uh, Governor of Central Bank of Malaysia said, uh, explain them to us. Explain what the social return is, how they work. And they couldn't explain it. She said, well, if you can't explain it, you can't sell it. And uh, they, they, they uh, didn't have those problems. Which brings us to the final question, which is the, the, the quick point I want you to make about Greece, which has it been targeted by speculators who are out to get it? in the way that Hong Kong was in the um, 1990s. That's right. I, I think th I'm glad you raised the Hong Kong, because uh, in one of my earlier books, I talk about the Hong Kong double play. And everybody should know about this particular episode, because it is such a, a wonderful uh, episode. You might say it shows the brilliance of the markets, but it also shows what governments uh, can and should do. Uh, the Hong Kong currency, uh, the Hong Kong had a peg against the, uh, a peg, and, and it got attacked. And uh, they sold short the Hong Kong dollar. Speculators like small countries because they have an advantage. You can overwhelm them, so they think. So they, they attacked. Um, and they said, well, the normal way governments respond to a currency attack is to raise interest rates. And then they figured out when they raise interest rates, stock markets go down. And so what we'll do is we'll sell short the stock market. That way we have Hong Kong going and coming. If it doesn't respond, we make money on the exchange rate. If it does respond, we make money on the stock market. Well, the Hong Kong government figured this out, and what they did is they said, we'll go in and we'll raise the interest rates and we'll buy stock and support the stock market. Well, the response from U.S. Treasury, Rubin, from, from uh, 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 Wall Street was, this is not the way capitalism is supposed to run. <laughs> when we attack, you're supposed to transfer money from your country to us, to Wall Street. This is the rules of modern capitalism. Don't you understand? And uh, intervening in the market like that, well, that's, you know, um, the, the, the upshot of it was Hong Kong made a pretty profit out of it. Uh, it outwitted the speculators. And I'll leave to you to figure out what the implications for Greece are, but it, 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 it is clear that uh, there is at least a possibility that a similar kind of thing is going on today. We have to decide who to give the book to. I'm going to steer you towards the sixth form girl over there, okay, because <laughs> okay. she's the young one. Okay. You, you, you okay. can see? Okay. okay. <laughs> one last question before we close. Um, one last question before we close. We're in a hurry. We're in a hurry. Do you get more left wing as you get older? Because you're quite left wing, really, aren't you? <laughs> Well, you see, I think of myself as being very centrist. Uh, and I do get criticized from the left because I believe markets are a, an instrument for economic growth, but markets have to be shaped. Now, uh, what is true uh, was that uh, when I went to the World Bank and I saw some of the things that went on there, uh, I became more aware of some of the problems with uh, unfettered markets. Uh, and when I saw some of the uh, political mach machinations and some of the things that, of the way uh, the pressures that were put to repeal Glass-Steagall, the law that separated uh, commercial and gambling casino, banks and gambling casinos. Obviously, that, that has some, some effect on one. So I suppose, I, as I say, I still think of myself as so moderate. The answer uh, is yes. That is, <laughs> you do get more left wing as you get older. <laughs> We have to let you go because it's your birthday, you've got dinner, you've got news night, you've got to, uh, you've got to rush off. You've barely touched all the stuff in the book, so uh, buy the book, 
Professor Stiglitz, I'm actually going to ask you, by the way, if you can just let him run out, because he really does have, uh, it has to fit in quite a lot before Newsnight. It's been a great pleasure. Thank okay, you very thank much. You very much. Thank you. Thank you.